Okay. It's really odd. I guess we've started, everyone. Thank you all for coming uh, to this session entitled Parity Equals Performance. And you know, I was thinking about the title because uh, a lot of the time when we talk about uh, parity, we focus on the numbers only, like how many women percentage-wise are in a particular job or in education or in, in, in leadership positions in government or business. But really, I think there's another question which I like, which the, I think the title suggests, and that is that there's something missing, not just for the individual, but for the society by not having e women equally represented. So I do want to talk about numbers, and I do want to talk about reasons that the numbers are depressed, but I also want to talk about what's missing and why the world would presumably be a better, more interesting, more creative, more something kind of place if uh, we did reach parity more frequently. So that's my conceit for this talk, and if you don't like it, we can do something else. <laughs> uh, but we have four extremely uh, talented panelists uh, to join us today. Uh, I, I don't know if I should, maybe I should just go around the room uh, in order next to me. Sitting to my left is Maria Pinelli, or do you prefer Pinelli? Pinelli. Pinelli, okay. She's the Global Vice Chair uh, strategic Growth Markets, EY, which I learned is the new branding for Ernst & Young, and she's from the United, Ki she's in the United Kingdom now, but we've just established she's from Canada by way of Italy. And sitting <laughs> next to her is Jun Chin. She is chairman of Tsinghua Holding Technolo Technological Innovation Company from here in the People's Republic of China, and she's also a uh, World Economic Forum Young Global Leader. Next to her is Masako Egawa, who has a list of titles, previous titles, that, that fill up a, an entire card. But we're going to just say for right now that she's a professor at Hitotsubachi University in Japan. And finally, we have Nina Tandon, who's president and chief executive officer of Epibone in the United States which is a company that's seeking to grow bone and do things with it, which we could all use at some point. So Maria, I'd like to start with you. I mean, what about my premise? Is there anything to that? Are we, I mean, I know we've focused on the numbers as, and that's a problem, but how about looking at it from this other perspective? Well, Joe, um, I'm obviously very passionate about this subject and, and that's why I'm sitting here with you, but you know, in, in a world today where the pace of change is faster than it's ever been and there's so many problems to solve, we need women at the table. They bring a better innovative, innovative answer. Uh, they, and we know this to be true. So, you know, my, my learning is, you know, NYU did a study on mathematical complex problems and they put a very diverse, uh, you know, non-expert team on the problem and then a homogeneous what they called expert team on the program and the random diverse team won and that that just proves so many of the statistics we know just like catalyst produced a report that said return on equity 66 percent higher for diverse companies those that embrace diversity and gender i mean the 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 evidence is clear but i can feel it in my own experiences is when you choose a random diverse team, that team wins every day. The second reason why, I mean, economically, women are going to, in the next five years, represent an additional $5 trillion in consumer spend. They're going to own 75% of all discretionary income by 2028. This is the next, this market women as a market is bigger than India and China together at a combined growth rate. And so it makes, it makes good business sense as well. Right. So, okay, but, but um, what's causing that shift to women having all the disposable income? Uh, in parity, opportunities. Um, I particularly work in an area of entrepreneurship, and I was just sharing earlier, um, you know, we're, we're mentoring over 300 women Japanese entrepreneurs. And actually, it, it's quite interesting. A, more than a third of all private businesses worldwide are run by women, Nina being one of them, and, and June here. Um, 
they just don't scale. And mm -hmm. we're seeing that opportunity to really bring those businesses on par. And that is happening every day. Those opportunities are opening up every day. And that changes the game for many women. So is that something that you are seeing here in China, that that, that shift is taking place, or that there's a need for that? Well, actually, from the perspective of China's economic development, actually the management team in terms of the proportion of females, it's increasing. And also the number of female entrepreneurs is also increasing. But in the future, actually, you can make a lot of money from children and also women. And this is a huge market. However, in terms of the promoting economic innovation and development nowadays, actually females are still in the disadvantage place. Why is that happening? Why are women in a disadvantaged place? Uh, because I think uh, very important reasons reasons. First of all, for women, they share heavy burdens. They have to work outside of homes. They also have to take care of their children. They have to be the home carer. They have to educate their children. Especially in the tradition of Chinese culture, women are supposed to be doing this kind of job. And also, women have some labels on them. What are those labels in China? Because in China, we always think that uh, men are the breadwinner and uh, women are the home taker. So I don't think women's contribution have been recognized fully in a society. So even if they contributed a lot, they are underestimated. So, um, and another reason is that for women, they are not brave or courageous enough. When they are faced with huge challenges and also under huge pressure, they are not fully motivated to face up the challenges. And because I myself have invested in a lot of startups and I've seen a lot of new women or new females, they have already had a shifted understanding or perspective compared to the traditional mindset of Chinese women. I think in general, it's improving, but it's not that good. I'll follow this up one more, one more time. So if women have to uh, still have a major role in the family and, and taking care of the household and get into the workforce, isn't that going to take super women to populate the, uh, uh, the, the top echelons of, of business? Or, or do the roles have to change at home so that they don't have to do all the work at home and the work in the business? Well, actually, in China, in the past, females, those very successful female entrepreneurs, what should I say from the impression of the society? Actually, if you are a very successful female entrepreneur, then anyone would think that you don't have a family at all. You have this label on your body. You need to be a home taker. If you are successful in business, then you don't have a family. I think this is actually a stigma for women. For me, for instance, I always talk to myself that I need to be success successful in business. If you are dedicated or committed to what you are doing, you become more beautiful. And if you contribute to the society and the social development, and you can achieve the self-growth, which I think is a very important process for women. However, I am also faced with a challenge that you have a lot of problems with your children. When you are traveling, for business trips. What do you do? Do you, 
take care of your children or do you go on the business trips? This is a contradictory process and also a huge challenge is the time management and you need to give up a lot of things. In daily work, sometimes I take my children with me and take my children with me to the meeting venues, to the airports, to the hotels. I would like to strike a balance, but I don't think not all of us can balance that because you're not in the position to do this. So sometimes, yes, the pressure is huge, is amounting. Oh, well, that's maybe then I can ask Masako, how does that, what, what you hear from China, how does that resonate with what your experience is in Japan? Sure. Um, the, uh, the need, the pressure to choose between work and um, responsibility at home is also very important in Japan. So that put the pressure on women in Japan and uh, women's representation in economic and political arena is very, very low. But today, because we are talking about innovation, I want to focus on the gender gap in science and technology. And I would argue that that's very fundamental. Um, if you think about the ratio of women in those engineering science, uh, I heard that the, uh, in China, uh, women account for about 40% of the engineering jobs, whereas uh, in United States and Europe, it's maybe between 20% or 30%, but in Japan, it's 10% or less. Um, and I want to raise three reasons why we have to correct this, why correcting gender gap in science and technology is very, very important. Uh, first, um, the, um, I hear that the, because we produce smaller number of PhD in engineering science, companies who want to hire diverse scientists and uh, diverse workforce cannot hire in a sufficient number of engineers and scientists. So that's a problem. And number two, um, as Maria just mentioned, uh, diversity leads to innovation. So I would argue homogeneous teams cannot really innovate. And, and the reason number three, um, we sometimes hear, especially in the area of medicine, there are certain uh, gender-specific phenomenon or disease. And I, I hear that female scientists sometimes discover, make scientific discoveries which overturn the common understanding of the scientific findings to date because uh, male-dominated sci scientists just focus on um, maybe experiments primarily of men and do not notice some disease or symptoms are specific to women or gender. So uh, di discovering those um, new discoveries, of course, important to, um, to, to human beings overall. So we really feel that the, um, uh, for those reasons, we need to correct the gender gap uh, in science and technology. Okay. Nina? Yeah, um, so, so not, I, I mean, to build on what you guys were saying, you know, um, diver it's well known that diverse teams pr pr produce more innovation. Um, there's a Harvard Business School study that specifically studied the complex reasoning skills of diverse teams and tried to find out um, who was better at, which kinds of groups were better at collaboratively solving problems. And the only, this is 10-year-old research, right? The only piece of data that could explain the um, increased performance was the number of women on the team. So not just diverse teams, but the number of women on teams has been correlated with complex reasoning skills. Now, this research was updated 10 years later because, as we know, the nature of collaboration is changing. We have um, new online tools that are a little bit different than us sitting in a room together. And the, what was interesting is that the results still held. And so, actually, my office mate at the time um, was a man, and he wrote to me, my, my friend Rob, and he said, maybe that's why we're doing so well. We have, we have so many women here, um, because we came from a lab um, where our, our, um, our professor was a woman. Um, and, you know, my, my work, actually, to build on what you were saying about um, when, this be when are the stakes really high? 
Um, I mean, we know that women control the consumer dollar. Um, you know, in Amazon, this is a big um, issue because you know women are controlling the consumer dollar, uh, the consumer spending, but aren't necessarily represented in leadership. Um, and, and that mismatch is definitely important. I think the stakes are really high with healthcare. And my research for my PhD was on cardiac tissue engineering, actually growing cardiac tissue um, to try and replace damaged and failing hearts. And when I learned that heart attacks are consistently misdiagnosed in women because the symptoms just don't feel the same. Men, male doctors will say, will, will not diagnose a heart attack in a woman because the symptoms aren't, they're, they, I mean, if you hear what they're called, right, a sense of impending doom, that is one of the symptoms of a heart attack in women. Um, feeling not so great, you know. <laughs> there's things that you can't measure without an EKG. And so unless you get an EKG when a woman will say something aspecific because that is just how pain happens to manifest in a very life-threatening disease, it will be misdiagnosed. Mm -hmm. And um, that's just one example, mm -hmm. right? And we could go on and on. And so not, we're not just the consumers. We're not just, it's not just diversity. It's, it's women specifically in, in teams. And the stakes are so high. Well, that was an extremely helpful tip. Well, we'll ask for the test. Ask for, ask the, for test. the test. Yeah, right. You know, EMTs are now um, ordered to actually give EKGs when they have a specific symptoms in many t many cases because, especially in women, this is an issue. Yeah. So pain so feels different for us. We've just yeah. solved a major problem here. If this information gets out, <laughs> wow, ask for yeah. the test. Well, ask for the test. Yeah, ask for but, the EKG. But I, I medical <laughs> progress aside. <laughs> um, I want to I want to ask a different question, if I may, and that is: so, if there's a clear economic advantage to yeah. having a diverse team, and even not very bright CEOs know that when there's a clear economic advantage, you go in that direction because it makes you more money. Mm -hmm. Why hasn't it changed? I mean, you're looking at me. I'm, I'm, I'm going to speculate because I right. don't think anyone really knows the answer. Um, I do think that we as humans, we don't like to change. Mm -hmm. Change is scary. And, you know, change should be scary. I mean, think about all the Darwinian forces out there. Change can mean that you might be obsolete, right? And so I think many times when we're confronted with change, <laughs> you're laughing. Um, it's the end of the day, guys. Um, so. When we're confronted with change, it's scary. And if change means that, oh, I might be, you know, if, if, there, if you believe that the C-suite only has room for men and, if, and that if there aren't, and, and forget the, you know, women, transgender, we have a whole new notions of gender that are coming out. It's not just men and women. We have a range, a fluidity, a new vocabulary that we're developing about gender. But let's just pretend it's men and women for the moment. Um, if you, do you really want to be the person to write yourself out of history? You know, and, and men have been so good at writing women out of history for so long. You know, all, Rosalind Franklin discovered, you know, the, the, the she took all those x-rays of DNA and, um, you know, happened Who? to collapse. Rosalind Franklin. Ha, ha, ha. Uh. Um, there's so many examples where, um, you know, women have been actively written out of the records. And so, you know, it's just, I think it's self-preservation. We're humans. We're afraid of not being relevant. And I, I think that that's, a, it's something we should just talk about. Let's talk about being afraid. Well, we're, you know? we're definitely on a journey. Yeah. And, um, you know, you, it takes critical mass to really affect change, you know. And, and often people talk about 30% being that critical mass, which is where, where these quotas come from. I, I am very concerned. I mean, the, the World Economic Forum uh, published a report that said it's going to take 80 years to achieve gen gender parity. I mean, that's four generations. Certainly, um, we won't be around to see it. Um, if, if that is the case. So we really need to speed up the clock. And, and I think it's incumbent on all of us. And I, I think we've heard some good themes here. You know, some of it is, is um, advice to women. You know, uh, the guilt that, that one feels every day balancing multiple roles. The ability to think bigger, uh, to aspire, you know, to new, new careers, new tech technological advances to really be part of the future. And I, I think there is an, a responsibility for women to really step up and bring other women along, you know, uh, climb the ladder, but then get right down there and 
pull somebody up, you know. I, Don't leave I, it down uh, behind them, just pull them right up. Yeah. Yes. And, and we, as, as leaders, here we are at the World Economic Forum, I mean, these are the business leaders that can, the world leaders, even in government, right, we need to see more women at the table, and we need to affect that change. I, so I'd I agree, oh, yeah. uh, because I think in addition to uh, not wanting to change, I think people have a tendency to hire somebody like you. Mm -hmm. So men tend to hire men because they are more comfortable. And you raised a good point about women need to be pulled up because we all know women tend to underrepresent themselves. I hear stories about experiments. If you have a boy and a girl with exactly the same score in math, say 85 out of 100, boy would say, I'm good at math. And the girl would say, I'm not good at math. And that happens all the time in a workplace, uh, universities, everywhere. So we, we need to really pull the women and then really put them, on a, 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 put them in the right positions and then we, until we, need, we reach the critical mass. Yeah, I, I just want to offer something that came to us as a surprise. Um, so we're, we're doubling the size of the team at FEBO and, um, and we had to go through a lot of resumes and do some hiring recently. And I should mention that there, we're a very small team at the moment. Um, <laughs> it's, you know, we're, we're three of us full time. It's, so it's me and two guys, okay? And um, so we're hiring four people full time and um, <laughs> every single one of them is female. And I'm joking with my colleagues, do you guys want to be the only men at the company? What's going on? And they said, well, you know, there were so many more female applicants than male applicants and they drastically outclassed the male applicants. And we're trying to wrap our heads around what this is. Um, but I suspect that there's some pulling that the fact that there's a female face in the world that's representing the company, we are, we're getting, it's, it's not quite pulling, I, I don't know what the word is, it's attracting maybe, female mm -hmm. talent, and it is so exciting, oh, I'm not model. apologetic mm -hmm. about it at all, it's exciting, mm -hmm. and, um, and I think that there's, there's something, you know, and I will say about women not representing themselves enough, so we don't have a ton of money to really spend on, on salary, and this is the startup situation, right? And um, one of the women asked for a higher salary than what we offered. And before I told her the reasons why we couldn't do it, I thanked her. Said, woman to woman, I am so happy that you're asking this question because women don't do it enough. Mm -hmm. um, and then explained to her, well, our situation. And, and you know, but it, it, was, it was like, look, I need you to know that I have to thank you for doing this. Women don't do it enough. But, you know, you, I also wanted to give some context about where we are. I think. Um, we, we, as women, I think, can um, do better at advocating for ourselves and, and asking for what we need. Do you find that? Uh, sorry, you were... Okay. Um. So I feel try to uh, uh, push forward the rise of uh, women representatives, especially in, your, in the new economy, and uh, so it's quite uh, necessary. So I have my first you know, three suggestions. The first one, as uh, today we have these uh, wild young leaders at this uh, table. So they have the power to push forward in their different uh, workplace and under their influences, try to uh, influence a lot of people. So we have to uh, maximize to set up such a new culture. This uh, culture for the women, they should be not uh, afraid, they should be uh, bold enough. So we have to set up such an encouragement mechanism, try to uh, advocate the female, they should have their own uh, career. They should be uh, involved in the society uh, progress, including the science and technology. And also, I think, for the female uh, development uh, process, so for the whole society, we try to uh, be uh, more inclusive and uh, respect and give them uh, more uh, courage. So for the understanding is not enough. So the perception is not enough for the uh, women, whether they are uh, bold enough, so that's uh, difficult. So the, finally, for our women, ourselves, we should be uh, proactively participate in the society. So as today, the so women try to uh, mix, maximize our influence. So that is the guiding of the right uh, value. 
And uh, secondly, try to uh, maximize our uh, uh, position. So it's kind of uh, a setup of our healthy uh, psychology. You should have a correct and a healthy uh, mood and also psychology. So with our in influence of an individual, we can influence a group and a larger group, a big mass. We have the positive uh, forces to spread to the whole society. So I believe the rise of uh, women so we're getting uh, more and more uh, uh, powerful with the coming of uh, internet in many uh, workplaces. So we do have the advantages. It is our gifted and advantages of uh, women. How to uh, maximize our advantages? So uh, for the gender parity, so in this uh, journey, so I fully agree. So I cannot wait too long. So for the whole society development should be uh, in a harmonious way. So we should have the diversity of both uh, men and uh, women. So for the consuming society, for the new uh, women, so the consuming is not the only thing they have to consider. So in addition to their families, so they try to uh, maximize their efforts in their own uh, uh, career development to influence uh, more people. That means a lot of men will be affected by the development and also the healthy mental set by women. Because women have a very good idea and also understanding about the technology and also the industrial development, which I think will also change the mindset of men, which also I think we need to have a combination of culture and also the understanding and also the education and campaign of this idea because I think it will affect more and more people and the courage and the healthy mindset of women and their contribution to the social development will be greater. I have a question about um, men's role in this process of change <laughs> because um, I just want to tell a brief story about my own family. So I, th I think of myself as somebody who um, understands what you're saying, doesn't get in your way, but even I probably have unspoken biases that I'm, I can't necessarily be aware of. But when I was doing some stories about representation of women in academics, uh, a lot of women said, well, we drop out because we want to have families and that slows things down. And so I thought, okay, I have a family, but I feel my, both my wife and I have pretty high-powered careers. So does my wife feel that I did 50% of the child care or less? Because I felt I did 50%. So with a lot of, say, well, that's what, so with a lot of trepidation, <laughs> I went and asked her and she said, yes, 50%. Good. But that, that's yeah, shall so we shall good. Shall we? We the question is, well, yeah. well, that's that's that, but see, that's the reason I bring it up. I wonder what it seems to me that you're you were describing about pulling women up and doing things like that. I wonder what you have to change in men's apart from telling them, look, you have to deal with this. You said it's scary, but you have to deal with it. How can you bring men along in this journey? How can you get them on board? Absolutely critical. Um, you know, people talk, talk about mentorship, but actually sponsorship is uh -huh. what you need. I mean, those are two different things. And, you know, we were hearing earlier, um, you, you know, Nellie Krauss always points out that uh, boys and girls are exposed to code mm -hmm. early in their, their childhood. And then there's a drop off, right? And I think that those, Really understanding, if we really want to get serious about the issue, really understanding where those critical trajectory um, moments happen, you know, where we lose them, that's really the time to get in and, and really affect change. And, and I've, I actually feel, you know, not to take this too low down the spectrum, is getting back to the corporate level as well. I mean, really understanding. Uh, some of the company statistics here that were mentioned earlier, really creating accountability for diverse representation, for diverse voice, really understanding if there is a diverse team. I mean, to me, it's, it's amazing that 60 to 50% of voice on social media on all the world's major platforms are a woman's voice. Mm -hmm. And yet, when you get behind big brands of these companies, only 18% of women are represented yeah. at the table in any meaningful way.
Mm -hmm. We're not even talking at board level or C-suite in a meaningful way. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, I think creating that joint accountability. And in your example, Joe, congratulations, but you know, there, there was a book written, The Cinderella Syndrome, mm -hmm. uh, about young girls. And so at a certain age, actually, they score very high academically um, ahead of boys. And at a certain age, they lose to peer pressure and they focus on, well, I'm Cinderella, Prince Charming's gonna come with the slipper. You know, I think we all have to say there's no slipper, right? The slipper is, you know, put it on and keep walking, right? <laughs> keep going, you, you know, you're doing great, you can do better. You know, there's a, whole, there's a whole vision out there that looks different than Cinderella. And I apologize for the Western example, but um, because you know in China, you're, you're taught, Mao taught everyone you should hold up half of the sky. I'm always so impressed by the Chinese women because I see it in them, their spirit, even in the young girls. And I think this cultural change of us being accountable you, you know, participating and mm -hmm. really changing the mindset at critical times will make a difference. But does this, I mean, sometimes I worry that when you, you, when you raise this issue for women, the ones who don't achieve this or, or feel overwhelmed, they can begin to feel bad if they're not uh, achieving as much as you have shown is possible to achieve, you know, because some people rail against this, the expectation maybe. That's being that, that are being placed on them by successful women. Well, I don't know. I, I th yeah, go ahead. I think everybody has a choice. Mm -hmm. If some woman wants to really, you know, she wants to really focus on child rearing and then focus on uh, taking care of the family, um, I accept that because that's that person's choice. And I know many couples, some couples, um, that the men are the primary. Care, a caretaker for the homes. So I think it's fine for individuals to have choice. But the problem now is that the woman who wants to have both career and family can't have it. Mm -hmm. And um, in East Asia where um, gender roles thinking is very, very strong, that's very difficult. So um, many women have to be superwomen, as she was saying, yeah. to be able to have uh, career and family, and I think that's not that's forcing many women to say, "Well, I'll give give up career and then focus on um, home, yeah, taking care of home," which is the Cinderella syndrome you are talking about. So, coming back to what we can change, I think we really have to get uh, men on board and to really get rid of this gender role, and especially to improve the situation in Japan, I think we really need to work on the work hours because we have extremely long hours which makes it impossible for women to do everything. Mm -hmm. And that's actually um, uh, making it difficult for men even yeah. because as our society are aging, many men who are in the 50s, sometimes or 60s, have to take care of their elderly um, Families, parents, yeah. and then some senior executives are leaving their jobs. So that's becoming a problem. So I think in order for everybody, both men and women, to have reasonable family life and a career, we just have to work together. And then, especially for Japan, we just need to um, shorten the work hours. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think men are equally victims in these gender roles as women. I think if you talk to many men, they want the same things that women want. They want flexible work hours. They want the ability. They don't want to be left out of uh, their family lives as well. And um, you know, I, I, there was a there was a study I remember seeing about um, what happens to in this in this case male CEOs um, when when what happens to them when they have daughters. And what's interesting is that that there, that was correlated with um, increased female promotion at the company and increased. Um, implementation of female friendly policies and I say female friendly and female promotion but actually men are the best feminists around or can be there's no reason not to be and men want the same things that women want the nature of work is changing for everyone um, physical location has um, is becoming less and less important. We have the ability to be, we, we're, we're global organizations where time zones and um, internet connectivity implies that we can disintermediate um, 
we can we can make communication a little bit more asynchronous at times. Um, and so I, I think that this is important to, to note that everyone wants these things. Um, I also think at the same time that we should be, um, when we think about the work that's being done in the home, um, and, and this is happening around me, um, you know, I live in New York City where there's a lot of um, apps being developed that help with convenience, things like um, having your laundry picked up um, and, and, and done for you, things like um, having a, you know, Uber to help you get around. Um, a lot of apps that are being developed that, um, that actually um, Disag disaggregate the nature of the kinds of work that can be performed in the house. And what I would say is that, in a way, this professionalization of what happens, the work that happens in the home, has an effect of, of attributing an economic value mm -hmm. to, this, to the work that's being done in the yes. home. And by doing this, I think that we can have much more savvy, much more analytical conversations about the type of work and how to divide the work up at home. My partner and I, for example, we talk about this. We say, you know, this work needs to be done. You will do it, I will do it, or we will outsource it. <laughs> because, you know, I think that that's a third option. You know, mm -hmm. it's not just, um, and, 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 and less so in different places. This is very much a geographic question. Um, but I think to the extent that we realize that female-friendly policies are policies that are friendly for everyone and that we elevate um, the, and attribute economic value to the work that's being done in the house, we can go um, pretty far. And then, I just wanted to yeah. add to that, Nina. I, that, I think that's an excellent point. And I, I actually, as you were talking about it, yeah. I was thinking about what is the infrastructure that you need to succeed. And like, to me, the fact that there's you know, 11 pieces of legislation to start a daycare in Japan is insane, Ugh. right? I mean, no men or women can't cope with that. I mean, so I do think, you know, government has a voice yeah. here. I'm, I'm always, you know, I've been favorably um, uh, impressed that President Obama raised the fact that of VC-backed companies led by s women CEOs, less than 5% receive VC financing, right? I mean, bringing these issues to the surface and really trying to put some structural change in place, whether it's mm -hmm. developed by the free market, the entrepreneurial market, or whether um, they're structural in terms of government legislation, yeah. I think really helps. Yeah. Uh, Yes, I think for a woman, actually, they need the support from males, especially their partners. Just now, we mentioned a lot of fact that how for women to synchronize with men to develop as fast as men. I know there is some gap between men and women, but for me, I used to be one of the management in SOE companies and then I just quit my job from the state-owned company and I started up my own company. I have two children but I wanted to have two more kids and I thought according to the tradition of China actually men should be the one to provide the family but my partner said to me that they ne he needed someone to speed up with him, to achieve the self-growth with him. He didn't need a nanny just to take care of the kids. But sometimes I thought it's made by heaven, by God. Men should work and women should stay at home. But actually, my partner didn't think like that. He thought that actually women are very important. You cannot be a full-time housewife. You need to go out and work so that we can develop ourselves together and we can have very good communication and dialogue, especially mentally dialogue. And also with the development of internet, a lot of family chores can be outsourced. And uh, this is very good. For instance, in China nowadays, you can hire a nanny. It's not that expensive. And also, you can have special internet and website to help you to do the grocery shopping, which is very nice. In this way, women are freed by this. But actually, you 
mentioned you have taken care of the family for 50 percent of time, but um, we need some time to innovate, to think about other things. Sometimes we are too focused on the family chores. So for me, I think for a very good woman, especially to achieve the self-growth, we need the support from our husbands, which is very important. And this is a very reliable and solid couple relationship. And also my husband told me that when you educate your kids, if you only stay at home, you don't have much knowledge to pass on to your kids. And in this way, it's not the best case scenario for the growth of kids because the best school for kids are from their parents. So women should learn themselves. Women should achieve self-growth themselves, which is also a very good way for educating their kids. And I really think, and I would like to emphasize more, the role and function of men. In this way, I think women can have higher happiness index. Uh, for sure, I think um, full-time housewife is also a kind of work. It's very hardworking and uh, painstaking work because in this way you can provide a lot of um, help in the family and also you can release a lot of positive energy around your family. And also I think for um, men, you need to learn to compliment your wives. You should tell your wives you're beautiful, you are hardworking, you're attractive. In this way, I think women will be more and more confident in themselves. So for a woman, this is a healthy development and process socially, in the family, and also for themselves. So again, I would like to emphasize the role and function of men. Make me, it makes me smile because I was just sending a note saying, I'm so proud that you did this. So, um, <laughs> good, I've done the right thing again. Um, <laughs> Gold star. We, yeah, please, <laughs> pat on the back. Um, we have the opportunity to hear from the audience. It's a little awkward because I can't see all of you, but if someone would like to ask a question of the panelists or participate in some way, yes. Oh, can you wait for a <laughs> microphone and then... Hi, uh, I'm June. I totally agree with June about um, a, a successful woman also have a very important man behind her, absolutely. And uh, I think government has a lot, a lot to answer for why women is not there yet. I gave you one example, uh, Britain. During the war, all the women have to support uh, troops, uh, troops out, outside, all the women working, okay? But when the war finished, who, they, who, who the government and companies asking uh, who to leave the jobs? Women, go back to, go back to family. So I think uh, uh, the government has a lot to answer for why women is still not there. And another uh, good example is about Northern Europe countries like I think uh, Finland and also other countries has very high uh, good childcare policies and their women uh, take up important jobs are much more and much higher in other countries. Mm -hmm. Absolutely right. Yeah, no, it's, it's destigmatizing, I think, the roles that, that people have. Sorry. Um, yes. So I will ask a question in uh, Chinese. So it's better for uh, Mr. Qin to answer my question. My question is for Qin Jun. So from the uh, moderator and all the panelists, you have a very uh, balanced uh, interactive uh, uh, activity for the uh, main uh, moderator and also have the four the other business leaders. So I learned a lot, I take a lot of notes. So just now Mary mentioned, so the uh, uh, 
uh, we mean the CEO, so the percentage is only a five percent, very low. So for the uh, we mean the leadership is around eighteen percent. So in our forum, we we'll pay a lot of attention to eight uh, percent and also eighteen percent. So. So it's very important to give them some uh, advice and uh, comments. So Mr. Qin Jun in China, whether you are kind of 1% uh, of this 5%, uh, you are an excellent uh, representative. So among those 5%, uh, so just 5%, uh, that's enough, not only 1%. Uh, so for the three uh, uh, women uh, uh, entrepreneurs, so what are the critical uh, uh, factors for them? So I believe, as a, a woman, so you want to have an equal position with a man. So to look at, so your connection with a society, you should not uh, underestimate yourself. So this is a very critical issue. So normally, they don't have their uh, perception of their position in a society. So normally, he he uh, proactively put his, um, himself lower than the men. So this is one thing you have to consider. Secondly, so between the men and the women, no matter whether it's for the entrepreneurship or it's on the workplace, so you should have a more uh, creativity for yourself. So I believe in the past, uh, many uh, women, so they don't have this uh, courage. So they are always uh, hesitate. Maybe it's just a natural uh, characteristic for uh, women. They uh, prefer to rely on others. So for yourself, you have to set up yourself. So it should be a very uh, strong uh, perception of your own position to make yourself uh, even uh, uh, bigger or powerful. Thirdly, if you want to uh, have an uh, entrepreneurship, so a critical uh, matter, you must uh, find the uh, right uh, partner. So no matter how strong you are, you are only an individual. So you have to find the best uh, partner. So it's a kind of uh, a complimental to yourself in terms of, uh, of our energy, our power. You cannot compete with a uh, man for the coordination or the uh, tackling. And also a uh, man uh, has uh, their own advantages. Critical for women, you want to have find the best uh, partner for the entrepreneurship. Those are the critical conditions. And also, for women, if you want to have a good progress and a healthy development in their career, so you have to make yourself or mentally or psychologically more healthy. So if you are quite healthy in those psychology, so you have a lot of space. So you have to uh, uh, a kind of cultivate yourself. Uh, you don't have to go to the church. So I uh, am a, a Christian. I was born in such a Christian family. So from my earlyhood, I grew up in such an environment. So I have some uh, different uh, training. So you have to uh, make yourself to uh, maximize your own capability. You should have a healthy uh, uh, mental status. So that uh, relates to your own uh, choice. You should have a powerful and a strong uh, psychology. So we should have some uh, uh, beliefs. So you have to believe something. So to make yourself very calm, so you will not be so uh, uh, troublesome. So whenever you uh, address anything, so you'll be very uh, uh, calm down and also take up everything in an orderly manner. So this is the message I want to convey to all the women. Thank you. Why don't we take one from over here? I wanted to share some, uh, some numbers. Um, I was one of the directors of the Materials Research Society, where we looked at um, diversity. And we found that 25% um, uh, of the society was represented by women. 50% of the volunteers of the society were women. Um, there had been one president, female, and 1% uh, of the award winners were female. And um, what we found was that females were never um, nominated for, uh, for the awards by other females or by males. So I wanted to pick on your point that, you know, we discuss a lot about family, and I agree that you have to have a good partner to succeed. But in the end, when you have a profession and you have a career, 
we have to support each other. And right. I don't think that females support females as we should. Or uh, have mentors that mm. I never worked for a woman. All my mentors were male and they supported me. But I, I consider myself lucky. So I really think that since we are here, it's because we care, but we also have to do some work on mentoring and um, promoting women. Can you just motivation? So maybe one more question, do we have time? Yes, okay, why, why not a male? <laughs> I, feel very, I feel very alone at the moment. Uh, uh. Um, um, I, I'm Peter from New York, and you know I wasn't gonna, I wasn't gonna ask this question and, until you brought up that point. It's something that uh, I don't understand, so I'd like to put this to a, a question to the panel. And the question is this: um, When I became a leader, I'm a leader in, in the company I work for, and one of the first things I did was to try and get smarter about women's issues because we have, we don't actually have a, a gender problem in our company. It's one of our strengths but I knew I'd have to be more effective as a leader to kind of understand these issues. So this is now the eighth conference like this that I've been to, and I thought it was gonna be the first where I didn't hear that point brought up. That women need to, going all the way back to my first conference, it was actually uh, listening to a debate between Madeleine Albright, mm -hmm. and um, who was the uh, Secretary of State for the United States, um, and I'll never forget what she said. This is the first time I heard it. She ended the interview by saying, when she was asked the question, what made it difficult to be a woman in your role? Was it men? And she said, no, it was other women. And then she turned and she looked into the audience and she said, I was the only guy in the audience. It was like 50 women and me. And she said, I think there should be a special place in hell for women who don't support other women. And then every other conference I've been to, this point has come up, and it didn't come up tonight until just now. So my question is, for the group, as a man trying to be more effective at creating an environment where women can succeed, can you help me understand why this seems to be, why this keeps coming up as an issue, and what, if anything, should I be doing yeah. as a leader to mitigate it or to offset it because I don't, I don't understand. It's it. a point I, I need to. I feel like I need to respond to this because I, I was at a Women's Sphere conference in New York where um, I heard a lot of people at, on the stage um, talking about this issue, and um, and and then a bunch of peers were sitting in the audience, and we were saying, "I have no idea what they're talking about," mm -hmm. and and I suspect that there's a bit of a generational issue here, um, where there's um, there's been sort of waves of feminism that have had different edges that they've been um, working with. And I, uh, you know, whether it was just being the first woman in the room, that was an important edge. Whether it's um, breaking the glass ceiling, whether it's the numbers of people in the room. And, um, and what I see now is that with the younger women, that they're really, it, there's so much of the nature of work is collaborative that I don't, I don't see the issues as being women must support other women or that women aren't supporting other women. I think people are generally, if to succeed in any job, everyone has to support everyone more because work is so much more collaborative. And I think this is where women can really shine because, you know, we talk about fear. Fight or, the fight or flight reflex is what I think of when I think of fear. And what's interesting is that if you study the female brain and the male brain, um, what's, what's been learned more and more about women is that it's not just fight or flight. There's a reflex called tend and befriend. Um, which is when women experience stress, they look around them, is everyone okay? <laughs> and who do I get, who do I bring into the tent with me to, to stay away from the tiger? And so I think that women are in a unique position to really collaborate. And so I, I do, but I, I don't understand this myself. And, and, I, and maybe it's because um, I'm not in, in, in an older organization, you know, we're a small, you know, I've come up through academia, I had female mentors. I don't know what it is, but I, I find it mystifying as well, and I suspect that there's a bit of a generational issue here, and I would just invite anyone who wants to contribute about that to, to speak Nina, up. I, I can't help but jump in, and I, I totally, I agree with what you're saying, and maybe there is a generational shift, and if there is, I, I do hope there is. I'm looking around, and you know, people are nodding, and they're still not believing it, but. I think this goes back to critical mass 
and understanding mm -hmm. trust. Because as a leader, the most important thing you can do is establish trust. And what is the speed of trust? So trust amongst men and trust amongst women is different. They're interpreted different. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, some might argue, you know, the trust quotient for a woman is much too high. I don't know. I mean, everybody has a different point of view. So I think one is trust. But, you know, somebody here said, do you have any advice? And I, I always think, you know, someone gave me some great advice, which I always take, and is if someone has come to me and they have a problem with Joe or June, you know, the first thing I say is, have you spoken to the person directly, mm -hmm. right? If you haven't <laughs> spoken to the person directly, you don't have a right to come and speak to me about the problem, mm -hmm. right? Because you have not really sat down with the person and really explained how you feel. And really, you know, it, there's a lot of how you, how a, you know, a person's interpretation of trust and whether or not they feel they've been helped by a woman or a man or not is really the perception a lot is in your own mind. I agree. That okay. it's a, it's I'm in trouble here. Uh -oh. Are we <laughs> I'm about to do something that's going to sound arbitrary and mean. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> but we're out of time. <laughs> I'm getting the we can cut okay. sign. Oh. <laughs> so I don't want to cut you off. Okay. But I don't think I have a choice. I'm really sorry. Um, I hope we can continue this discussion offline, but I have to bring this session to a close. Thank you all very much for joining me.